Welcome to another webinar by the School of Media and Communication, Taylor's University. This is actually the Asian cinema class for the Masters of Communication program in Taylor's University. And I would like to welcome again our adjunct professor, Pak Hassan Mutalib, to join us. Hello, Pak Hassan, can you yeah. hear me? Uh, thank you, Adre. Yes. So, Pak Hassan, for your information, there are 51 students in this class. Oh, okay. And uh, 48 of them are mm -hmm. actually from China, mm -hmm. and one from Indonesia, and two Malaysians. Okay. So, they are everywhere. Uh, of only a few of them are in Malaysia. Most of them are in China. But nevertheless, uh, I think we can just carry on if you are ready, Pak Hassan. Yeah, sure. Okay, just hold on. Um, let me exit this because I need to um, share Pak Hassan's slide. Um, hold on, yeah. Okay, so I share the slide, yeah, Pak Hassan? Yeah, okay. Hold on. Okay, this is the right one, yeah, Pak San? Mm -hmm. That's the first one. Okay, so um, all yours, Pak San. All right, thank you. Uh, hello, boys and girls. I hope everybody is fine. So we'll be talking about early uh, Malay cinema, uh, which began in Singapore. So... Malaysia and Singapore have a shared cinema history during the time of uh, the British when they colonized us and we were called British Malaya. So when cinema came to Nusantara, both here and uh, Brunei as well as uh, Indonesia, it was not uh, what you call a uh, cultural, cultural shock. Uh, it was something new, but because uh, the people here were already uh, into shadow play, which we call wayang kulit, uh, which is very, very similar to cinema by having a screen and then there's a story with characters, with a plot, and then there are sets, there are moving images, there are perspective, there's perspective and uh, props, sound effects, music, and the voice of the puppet master who will tell the story. And all this is coming from the screen. So that's why it's very similar to film. And in the West, shadow play is recognized as the earliest cinema. So uh, the roots of Malaysian storytelling is in our traditional performing arts that includes the shadow play and then the Malay opera and then the modern drama is all there. And uh, we have what we, we used to have what we call Panglipo Lara or the village storyteller who went from village to village telling stories. So after that came the shadow play and uh, everything else uh, with sets and so on. Uh, next uh, slide. <clears throat> so the first film screening in Kuala Lumpur was in 1897 at the present, uh, present location of the Slango Club. And uh, in the newspaper, it was advertised that on 27 November 1897, there will be lifelike representations of scenes from uh, actual life. So there were quite a number of short films. And uh, three days later, it was shown in, the China, in Chinatown. And everybody went behind the screen. They thought there were people behind the screen and we were seeing those images. So they thought it was the shadow play. Next. The first films made in uh, British Malaya, uh, the first one was a Chinese film called Zin Ke. And in 1934, the first Malay language film called Leila Majnun uh, was made and screened. And uh, it was based on a Persian story directed by a, a, a film director from India and produced by a producer from India. And the uh, actors were all locals. 
So according to those who had seen it, it was almost like a Malay opera on the cinema screen with uh, overacting and so on. In next. Uh, Cik Hassan, can I just ask? Yeah. Um, this is also new to me because mm. um, when I first started uh, to study film, mm. we were all told that the first film was Leila Majnun. Mm. Uh, okay, do you have uh, a bit more information on this uh, Zinka or the immigrant film? Uh, yes. Uh, Zinka was a recent discovery uh, by two writers who had written uh, latent images. I'm sure you have that book. Uh, about Singapore cinema and they wrote a book about the entire film. It's available and uh, it, was, it was said that the film was so badly censored that most of the plot was lost. So they only knew about this film after going through the Chinese newspapers. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what's the background of the uh, filmmaker? Uh, he was a Singaporean but of course came from Hong Kong. Okay. And uh, There was a, uh, he was a producer himself, Guo, uh, Guo Chao Wen. And uh, uh, there was a big write-up in the newspapers about how it was made and the cast and so on. But the quality of the images is not so good, so this is all I managed to get. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, next slide. So 1950 Singapore was very exciting and very interesting. So the war had just ended in 1945. And uh, people were picking up their lives. And many people migrated from the peninsula uh, Malaya and uh, came over to Singapore because that's where everything was happening. Next. So they migrated and it was all for survival and to get a career. But at the same time, there was also frivolity. That means uh, they were enjoying uh life a bit because they came from the villages and the small towns where there was not much entertainment and you know everybody knew each other so they couldn't do uh, anything wrong but when they came to singapore nobody knew them so there were cabarets uh, there were cinemas and uh, you know they used to go out together and uh, uh, among the uh, migrants from uh, the peninsula uh, from all the different different states. So the people from Kedah in the north uh, flocked together. The people from Kelantan uh, had their own community and so on. But at the same time, they were also feeling, had feelings of alienation, which is they felt estranged because they had left their family, their girlfriends, their fiancés, uh, their wives and children. So there was also an element of a loss of identity. So they came To Singapore, they knew nobody and uh, everything was strange to them and there were a lot of Chinese or other, or other, other races which they had never experienced before. Next. So Malays were also involved in business, media, in li literary writing and also in the entertainment industry. <coughs> so the first film that was made after the war was in 1948. Uh, and uh, it was called um, The Call to Independence and uh, some of the locals and the people who migrated were working on it. But it was when P. Ramli, our most famous filmmaker, when he began to be involved in films, that's where everything, uh, there was a change. This was in 1955. So before that, he was only a playback singer and he was a, a bit actor And he was involved in many, many aspects, uh, helping with the camera and so on. And this is where he picked up the skills of filmmaking. So when he became a film director in 1955, uh, it, all that came uh, 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 into, into use. So uh, the, the Malays who were involved in business, including P. Ramli, uh, they were very good uh, at English. And if you're good in English at that time, because it was more or less the lingua franca, Uh, you could make it. But most of the people who migrated, the Malays, they were illiterate. They did not know how to read. They did not know how to write. And uh, next. So, uh, these are the important films that were screened in Singapore at that time. And Piramli went to see these films and 
it motivated him and it also inspired him uh, to steal some of the ideas for his films. But the wonderful thing was that when he copied scenes, you never knew that he had copied it from anywhere because it seemed to be original. So uh, Rashomon was one of the films where, uh, which he copied uh, some scenes and Sanshiro Sugata by Kurosawa was later made into a film called Kanchan Tirana. Uh, it was a, a, almost an exact copy, uh, but turned into Malay uh, in uh, Kuala Lumpur. But because of budget problems, it was really not well made. Next. So there were... Sorry, uh, I, uh, yeah. Pak Asan, I just want to ask a, a question here. Um, in, in our Asian cinema class, Mm-hmm. We are actually now in week um, six. So yeah. we have gone into Iranian cinema, um, Indian art cinema, and Pata Panchali was also shown. Mm-hmm. And um, so we are moving from west of Asia, going slowly to the east, mm-hmm. to, to, the, to the far east. So we are, we are yet to reach Japan. Right. Uh, but the question here is, uh, Pak Asan, that means at the time in, in Singapore, Mm-hmm. Although we have all this um, migration of um, locals from all parts of Peninsula, Malaya, as you mentioned, um, and although Singapore was just a small island, but when you mentioned that all these films, these are all important films in the world at the time. Yes. So when they were shown in Singapore, that means the nation then, although we were under British Malaya, mm-hmm. we were not out of touch from world cinema. Is that true, Parson? Yes, yes, that's right. But uh, uh, some of the, uh, what you call, art house films uh, did not make it, only a few, like uh, what I have uh, on the slide. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay, so early in Malay cinema, uh, the directors who came from India they were all told, and it was in their contract, not to criticize the British or any other race. Therefore, what we see in Malay cinema of the 50s and 60s it was only criticism of royalty, aristoc- the aristocrats, the people who were Sayyids, uh, uh, descended from the Arabs, and the Hajis, the people who had gone to uh, the pilgrimage and came back, and of course the wealthy, and mostly about the common man. Next. So Piramli's observation, he was a very good observer of the Malays who had migrated and also of the other people in, uh, uh, who were already from Singapore. So these people left their family and home and it was a transition from the village to the city. So that definitely would have caused a lot of uh, displacement and the alienation, but there was this need to survive. And they had to resist temptation, which means uh, they had they had wives, they had fiancés, but of course they'll be meeting uh, new people, and uh, so the temptation would have been there. So there were loss of there was loss of identity, loss of values, and the loss of their Malay roots and their traditions and culture. So Piramli observed this, and in most of his uh, early films, we can see how he is appealing to the Malays not to forget those roots and also not to forget religion. And this was one of the reasons for Samera Padi, where there was an emphasis on following the religious edicts. So some Malays became capitalistic and then they did not uh, try to help the struggling Malays or the Malays who had just uh, come into Singapore and help them to also succeed. So we see this in all his films, especially in Pandeka Bujang Lapo, the... Uh, the vagabond bachelors. Next. So, uh, they were confronting a new milieu and they had to negotiate that modernity which they were not used to while maintaining the traditional values. So, if uh, uh, Piramli was also looking at all this and trying to guide the Malays, very much later, Mamad Khalid in Kuala Lumpur was also more or less doing the same thing, uh, asking the Malays not to forget, the modern Malays, not to forget their traditions and all the good values and also uh, the language 
I can see that in uh, many of the local firms now, the language is very, very coarse and very rough. Next. Yeah, I, I was just um, about to say the same thing, Pak Hassan, that mm -hmm. uh, based on this slide, uh, it seems that although P. Ramli started doing this back in the 50s, but it seems that this three themes seem to be a common uh, or common themes throughout Malay cinema even until today, isn't it, Pak Hassan? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, uh, so, that... I think quite a bit of it is connected to the political development because uh, there are so many Malay parties, each one is trying to outdo the other in trying to uh, help the Malays. So this is actually a problem and it's confusing uh, the Malays who are not into politics. Yeah, but, but, but do you also see at the same time that perhaps this is a Malay dilemma that they are always since the days of black and white on screen until mm. now with the advancement of technology and cinema and now we are in 2022 that the Malays are always in a dilemma about uh, confronting what's new, negotiating modernity and at the same time trying to maintain their traditional values. So it's, it's, it's a question of identity actually. Yeah, what do you think, the, the feudal uh, era has been carried on into Malay society until today. For instance, like uh, uh, not being a traitor, uh, cannot go against the king, cannot go against the government. So many other, uh, so many things have come into play. On top of that, religion is also being misused uh, to control them to a certain extent. I remember in the 1970s, a former head of one uh, the government film studio told me, I do not like the way that the government is using religion to control the people. So there is a Malay dilemma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and it seems that it is um, it is never ending, isn't it, uh, Pak Hassan? As long as the politicians are <laughs> greedy for power and fighting uh, among themselves, it is going to go on. Okay. We have a question here, Pak Hassan, from um, sure. uh, my student, uh, Mei Yuen, who is a Malaysian Chinese. Uh, go ahead, Mei Yuen. Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I watched the the movie earlier, the Samara Padi, because um, a few years back I did a short study about P. Ramli, and as far as I know, I don't think he's really that religious. Like he's always very forward thinking. Oh, you but are right. This, yeah. So for this particular movie that I watched, I didn't watch last time. So um, we we watched it for this class. I was actually quite surprised that there was a lot of this Islamic thinking, the, the hudud kind of law. And I, I was a bit confused what he was trying to convey. Mm. So, ah. uh, yeah, yeah, I'm just curious about the thoughts. Uh, okay. Since he, you mentioned in this slide, currently yeah, yeah. that he's trying right. to maintain traditional values. Uh. Okay. So I knew Piramli and uh, met him a couple oh. of times. And uh, he was a very nice man who never talked about religion because I think he felt religion was a very personal thing. And you can see that in all his films, only one film, Samera Padi, was very, very, I mean, quite upfront with religion. But we must understand that he was also a different kind of filmmaker, even though he, it looked as if he was trying to promote religion in Samera Padi, it was actually something else which I will be talking about later. Yeah. So maybe um, Pak Hassan does intend, uh, and there are special slides for that, for the films that I have asked you all to watch, Semera Padi and also, uh, what was the other one, Pak Hassan? I forgot. Yeah, next one. Um, no, the, the, other film, the other one is Kaki Baka. Yes, Kaki Baka. So um, Pak Hassan will actually be giving an analysis on those two films, maybe in Ah, okay, Later. okay. Yeah. All right. Move fast. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. There were also other directors other than Piramli, and uh, there were there was Hussein Ane, Vem Amin, Jamin Sulong, Nordin Ahmad. I, uh, I knew uh, two of them, M. Amin and Jamin Sulong. I directed M. Amin for one of my films. But the other two uh, died very young. Now, uh, but they did not re reach the status of Piramli uh, from the point of view of cinematic representation. And Piramli was actually 
uh, very much. Uh, I, I do not know exactly how it happened. Maybe it was it was just instinct for him. Uh, but he really understood cinema. Okay, next one. So the, uh, we uh, jump forward <coughs> to Kuala Lumpur. Now, in the 1970s, there were there were quite a number of films, but it was nothing to shout about. Uh, hardly much we can talk about because mostly mostly made for entertainment, and some were really badly done. So next slide. The first film studio in Kuala Lumpur was the Malayan Film Unit, where I worked uh, from 1968. I was there for 28 years and uh, the man with no shirt became one of the director, director generals and he later became my mentor. So they were making films in this uh, act of huts and they were world-class films winning international awards at Venice, Edinburgh and so on. Next. And it was also the place where the first feature film in Kuala Lumpur was made in 1954. So in the 1980s, early 1980s, we began to see a new group of filmmakers coming onto the scene. And the earliest uh, were two people, uh, Rahim Razali and Hafsham, uh, on top, uh, left, and then uh, next to it. Now, uh, Rahim Razali made a very so uh, made, uh, social realist films that were very serious, talking about Malay identity and how to maintain uh, that identity and uh, maintain the culture and the heritage in the midst of being uh, involved in business and so on. Because the 1980s uh, took off and uh, Dr. Mahade came in 1981 and we began to see a drastic change. And I think Rahim Razali saw that it was not too good for the Malays who had come from the villages uh, due to the new economic policy. So, um, these new directors were trained in art, theater, film, and uh, were very articulate uh, about, about film and music and theater. So, uh, a new kind of cinema took place. But unfortunately, the audience was not there. Why? Because they, they couldn't understand, uh, not because these directors didn't know how to direct, but it was something very new for them. And unfortunately, that situation persists until today. Next. Could, could, could that also be, Pasan, that, um, mm. as you mentioned, since the start of cinema mm -hmm. uh, in uh, Singapore at the time, in the days of black and white, uh, until when people like uh, Datuk Rahim Razali and Hafsham came, yeah. that uh, especially films from Rahim Razali, as you mentioned, um, could it be because all the time the films were meant to merely entertain the audience? Mm -hmm. Could that be the main reason why the audience wasn't there, like you said, for mm -hmm. films coming from Rahim Azali? Well, I can say that all of them tried their best to make it make their films as entertaining as possible, uh, except for one or two who wanted to do a very, very personal film. And then even though they were also using popular actors and so on, somehow or other, it did not draw the audience. So, um, looking at Mat Kilau's success, I think uh, the director, Shamsul, understood the audience, that they are not interested in thinking. They just want to sit there and enjoy, and he had the sound very, very loud, because he felt that would uh, create the adrenaline rush. Right. So it, I think he was not wrong in what he was doing. Yeah. Could I could I could I also say, Pasan, that actually last week, uh, before we came into Malaysian cinema, we were looking into Bollywood cinema. Mm. Um and, and so now we know uh, the students know that the elements of Bollywood um would have song and dance sequences, for instance. Um, very uh, and you have it, it's, it's a masala film where you have all kinds of genres mixed mm. in one film yeah. um, so during the golden age of Malay film um, with the films made in the studios in Singapore you have 
more or less the same elements as well of having song and dance sequences, for instance. Yes, and yes, being the director's game. Yeah, very uh-huh. you know melodramatic. So, mm-hmm. um, is it true, Pasan, that that the filmmakers then, uh, including Piramli, of course, it, it wasn't really like that in Semerapadi, but his other films, could mm-hmm. it uh, could it be that filmmakers then were highly influenced by Bollywood? Well, the uh, Indian directors who came brought that kind of approach uh, into Malay cinema. So uh, when the Malays took over, they continued that tradition, including the Indian style of acting and so on. But Piramli changed that. Now, before Piramli, in the first one minute of a film, suddenly there will be a song. The hero or the heroine will be singing a song for, for no uh, without any motivation. Uh, but Piramli changed all that. He had a reason for, for a song. For instance, when some, uh, the hero was sad uh, or, or you know, rejected, uh, he would sing. Uh, that was to indicate what he felt. Yeah. Uh, but other songs, he put it into the sto- uh, He fitted it into the narrative. Yeah. Uh, that, that was uh, what was different with him. And other directors, local directors, uh, followed his example. Okay. Now, in 1954, when Malayan Film Unit made the first feature film, they had no reference except for Singapore cinema. Yeah. Therefore, when they made the first feature film, which was called Abu Nawaz, in the first one minute, suddenly the heroine, who is uh, hanging close to dry, she starts to sing a song. And then there is a duet. Then later at the end, uh, everybody sings together uh, to have a climax uh, for the ending. Mm-hmm. Oh, I thought the Malayan Film Unit was only doing documentaries, uh, Pak San. They did fiction oh, as well. Oh, they did. Uh, and this was uh, uh, part of the communist anti-communist drive because there was a Sai War. So the Sai War included uh, radio broadcasts and films. So they felt, films as well. Yeah, uh, they felt that since uh, Singapore cinema was also popular in uh, Malaya, mm-hmm. they, uh, somebody came up with the idea, why not we make a feature film we have Singapore actors and Singapore uh, music composers to compose a song and uh, make one, which is, was an anti-communist film. But it, it had a narrative. Okay. Mm. Yeah. And, and when, when, when we were looking into Bollywood cinema last week, um, when we talk about um, songs, right, um, we also found out that, uh, just like what you were mentioning just now, songs were actually written uh, to fit the story. And in Bollywood cinema, the songs were actually released way ahead than than the theatrical release of the film in the cinemas. Mm. Um, is it similar to to the time of um, Piramli? Yes, there were uh, a lot of music composers. Some were from Indonesia who settled in Singapore, and they were really good. And there was radio, and the songs went out on radio uh, when the film was being released, so it became a promotion. And uh, there were publishing houses, uh, music publishing houses. So there was actually big business in music at that time. And Piramli is actually more known as a singer and composer than as a film director. Yeah. And 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 uh, for the uh, benefit of our international students, Piramli is also an icon in Malaysia, not just for films, but also like Pak Hassan mentioned, uh, in terms of music, because he writes the songs, he 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 composes the songs, he he also sings the songs, and um, is isn't it not true, Pak Hassan, that um, the 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 songs became popular um, sometimes maybe more than the film itself, and the songs were actually written to fit with the narrative in the films. Yes, uh, this was uh, this began with uh, Piramli. Even though uh, some uh, Indian directors uh, also had the initiative uh, to have songs that fitted into the narrative, but not all. Sometimes it will suddenly break into into song. Yeah. Okay. Sorry to interrupt you with that, Pak Asan. Uh, it was very interesting. Uh, next. So next slide, yeah. Okay. So the issues and uh, subjects of the 1990s was about youthful angst frustrations and the effects of yellow culture. And uh, what do you call it? It was also about young people in a global world. And uh, Adit Manja, the top left, uh, was actually 
uh, a new kind of comedy with new kind of acting. And this was from Hafsham, who had studied in a film in uh, London. And uh, Abang, which was by Rahim Razali, uh, actually opened the eyes of the new wave of filmmakers that, hey, this is another way, uh, another direction to take. Because there were no references before this for this kind of cinema. And then uh, Nasir Jani came with the uh, Kambara Saniman Jalanan, uh, which was very, very critical of uh, the authorities, the establishment, and so on. And he was an angry film uh, because he himself was, uh, uh, there was a kind of alienation for him because he was very outspoken. And he was also a film critic before that. And he had been writing in the newspapers and the producers were making all the films in the 1970s. They were very angry at him. And uh, Amok, which was by Adman Saleh, was exploring this yellow culture brought in by an uh, uh, American teacher into the villages. And uh, we had the hero uh, who falls in love with her and then he gets affected. And there is some relationship to the uh, traditional beliefs uh, about martial arts and uh, certain uh, uh, spiritual elements involved there. And uh, Saman is uh, the one and only modernist film by Manso Pute. And uh, it was a very personal uh, film. And like Kambara Saniman Jalalan, uh, things that happened to Manso himself uh, became reflected in the film. And uh, Salubong, Salubong was very global in his approach. It's about young people of today who were educated, who knew what to do, and they were involved in uh, the global uh, issues, <coughs> like uh, things that were happening in the Middle East. Yeah. I Next. have another question, Pak yeah. Um With all these films and these directors, you pointed out just now that suddenly, starting with uh, films like Adik Manja and Abang, and with directors like uh, Hafsham and also Rahim Razali, what could be what could be the motivation behind the sudden change? What was the what was the cause of it, Pasan? I think it more or less began sometime in 1974, when uh, Datuk Said Alwi, our famous playwright, uh, was trained in film and theater in the U.S. Uh, he was making documentaries at Film Negara where I was working, and uh, he started the film club, the the Malaysian film club. Uh, and I was one of the earliest members and the only surviving member now. And he, in a sense, uh, uh, motivated me. And I must say he was a sort of a mentor to me also. And that's how I began to see world cinema. Before that, we, we never had a chance. So uh, people like Rahim Razali was acting on stage with uh, Said Alwi. And he also used to come to the shows. And I think that is where uh, the first spark was. And then later, uh, these people who have been trained in film and theater and so on, they were so upset at the low quality of the films directed by the directors who came from Singapore and also some of the locals. So there was this reaction to this kind of thing. And then towards the end of the 1970s, there were some TV dramas uh, made by a director called uh, Abdullah Zainal uh, with his uh, writer, uh, Johan Jaffa, uh, uh, who, <clears throat> who was a literary uh, writer and critic. So those uh, drama on TV were so much better than the films that were in the cinema. So there were forums and so on, there were any, and I attended some of this. And I also uh, became motivated uh, to go more into this uh, personal approach uh, films. So I'm sure these people uh, were also affected the same way I was. Yeah, so it sounds like um, similar to how the French New Wave started in France. Although, of course, in, in this class Asian cinema, we don't study uh, the history or the film movements in, in, in other parts of the world. But mm. that's how the French New Wave started, right? Uh, in right. cafes with people like, you know, Truffaut, Godard. <coughs> yeah, there were a few people like Dr. Anwar Noarai, who was my mentor, who had just returned from uh, uh, the US after studying film. And then uh, together with uh, Johan Jafar and uh, uh, not Rahim Razali, but uh, Nasir Jani, Mansur Puteh and a few others, 
they began something called uh, di- uh, dialogue cerde, uh, li- uh, translated literally, intelligent dialogue. So we had talks uh, on film, just like Kahe do Cinema in uh, yeah. uh, France. Eh? So that was the intention to create a group, a film intelligence here, so that uh, you can help to improve the standard of films. But unfortunately, they came up against a blank wall because the people that they were criticizing could not understand all this because they were not even trained properly. Yeah. So they kept doing uh, what they were doing and got very angry at all this criticism. Yeah. So so could it also be Pak Hasan, uh, one of the driving uh, force uh, that motivates this kind of films to come out by this kind of filmmakers is that maybe for the first time now filmmakers are actually educated in 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 the craft itself yes so they were not uh, talking to the people uh, who were making all those uh, uh, low grade films because they knew that nothing will change so i think in a sense they were trying to motivate uh, younger and newer filmmakers uh, to go in a different direction yeah okay we Next. continue so these were some of the directors who came in the 1990s, like Uwe Haji Shari, our foremost filmmaker here, uh, who had been trained in the US and he had directed films there. And uh, he, he studied at the school of the new school for social social research, where I heard that Marlon Brando even went to. And then um, uh, he's still uh, making films, but uh, not as many as the other directors. Next. So these were some of the firms uh, which I mentioned before, uh, young people in a global world, and then also Islamic values and identity in the modern world, all aimed at the modern Malays. But one other thing that developed was they were also talking about uh, filmmaking in Malaysia and about their own involvement. And this continued uh, to increase until today where they were lamenting at the fate of Malaysian cinema that it was not hated anyway. Next. Now, Spinning Gassing or the Spinning Top was the first film uh, to break the tradition of Malay films that only Malays were being shown or foregrounded and uh, it became more cosmopolitan and uh, there was a love affair between a Malay and a non-Malay and then there were also anti-establishment sentiments expressed and there, were, there was even a gay uh, element in the film and the director ran into so much trouble with the censor board and other people uh, that finally he withdrew from the industry and he has not made any film since then. So this was, I think, 1979. And then there was uh, Hishamuri Rais, a political activist, who made a film called from Jamapo to Manchester. It was about uh, three young people who wanted to go from their village to Manchester uh, to meet their fans, uh, their idols, uh, the football idols. Actually, they had no idea to go anywhere. So this was, in a sense, uh, talking about the young people today who are in Malaysia who are shackled by the establishment, by tradition and uh, customs and so on. And he was saying, break away from all of this. That's the only way you are going to succeed. And the last scene in the film is their red car goes off into the sky. So which means to uh, 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 go where your imagination takes you. Next. And the digital filmmakers in the year 2000. Now, uh, digital technology became used and we saw these young people experimenting beginning with Amir Muhammad with lips to lips uh, which uh, created a revolution. So young people began to see that now they could shoot with a, a small mini DVs and uh, even a high edge and, uh, and, uh, and it was a low, low resolution at the time. But they knew that now they could express themselves and finally we began to see 
a Malaysian cinema where films of uh, by the Indians, by Chinese, in the Chinese and Indian language began to be made. And the outside world began to take notice. So uh, 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 the, the film pro procurers came to Malaysia looking for newer and newer films. And many of these films went to the festivals and won awards. So these uh, filmmakers <coughs> uh, uh, garnered all the experience and they could even edit at home and work with friends at very, very low cost. Now, this, of course, caused problems for the feature film filmmakers who were spending millions to make their films. So that created some, a, a little bit of fiction. Next. So uh, another new wave uh, came after the initial wave of the digital filmmakers. And we also began to see them working with uh, mainstream filmmakers like uh, Yasmin Ahmad uh, and uh, Namrod. So Namro got to start uh, with, uh, with the film called Gidabe, which means gangster, and it was actually a political comment. Uh, disguised as uh, two groups, a, a group of uh, punks and skinheads uh, at war with each other. And then there were other fil filmmakers like Chris Song with karaoke and Yo Jin Han with uh, Sell Out, who were uh, lamenting at the fate of the non malays in a Malay-dominated Malaysia. Next. And uh, Yasmin Ahmad uh, was also uh, talking about maintaining traditional values in the modern world. And she called for uh, Malaysians to love each other and have compassion and celebrate that diversity, uh, which, which uh, from the some of the politicians who were creating problems just because they wanted uh, Malay votes, so they tried to create this friction. But Yasmin Ahmad and a few other uh, non-Malay filmmakers were uh, making films that were protesting against this. Next. And uh, other filmmakers came in. These were graduates from local universities. And uh, they explored different, different genres and subjects. Many of the subjects were topical and of concern to Malaysians. And the use of uh, visual effects, because of the advancements in uh, technology, they were able to do many, many things we could not be done earlier. Like uh, the special effects in Apocalypse X by Mama Khalid, which was set in the future. Next. So these were the digital filmmakers in the year 2000 who went on to direct mainstream films. But even though they were, it was for mainstream to go into the cinema for local producers, but they still maintain their indie approaches, their very personal approach that they were uh, used to. Okay, next. So these were other filmmakers who came onto the scene and are still active now. And uh, uh, they began to be given opportunities by local uh, TV, st uh, local studios, and TV stations. And uh, the guy at the bottom right is Brando Lee. Uh, his film, latest film, called um, "Don't Look at the Demon," will be screened tomorrow in local cinemas. And it is the first Hollywood film to be directed by a Malaysian. Uh, I'm uh, leaving out James Wan because he has already left Malaysia. So Brandon Lee is the first director uh, whose film now will be shown in 20 countries uh, all over the world, including in the US. And uh, next. So most of these directors, they were thinkers and they were concerned with what was happening in Malay society and politics and including the LGBT issues which is a taboo subject in uh, Malaysia and being played up by the party that is uh, Islamic based. Next. So there was an attempt to break into the interna international market by having a Hollywood actor or Hollywood actors uh, acting in this film called White Kingdom, directed by a local. 
and then an animation feature film war of the worlds directed by a uh, hollywood director and then uh, also shown in the us and uh, don't look at the demon now is the first one that was totally directed a uh, uh, hollywood movie that was directed by a local next oh, okay that's the end so, uh, so we'll go to the next uh, powerpoint where we will talk about samera padi and kakibaka and i will relate some of the elements that i've talked before which we will find also in this films okay um in the meantime while i switch to this other slides any questions from anybody uh, based on what pak hasan has uh, been talking about just now no sir uh, so far so good okay thank you abram all right um now we switch to the next slide Okay, okay. Pasen. All right. Uh, hang on, Pasen. Uh, there's yeah. a question there from um, Dashini, who's um, uh, a Malaysian as well. Go ahead, Dashini. Um, as it was mentioned earlier from the P family slide, although as a Malaysian. I did not know that P Ramli was a famous director. We only known him for his films, as a as an actor, but not as a director. How does it make a difference as an actor and a director? Hmm. Okay. Uh, P Ramli was unusual because mm -hmm. he he uh, he was able to sing. and he had all the other uh, what do you call qualities of being a composer and he could play instruments and then he could also write and uh, he can ha he could handle comedy and uh, what do you call uh, uh, drama and uh, and so on so uh, i don't think it is because he did not want to give uh, that opportunity to other actors and so on so uh, he knew that uh, he could he could he could give he could make it uh, what do you call uh, bring it to real fruition uh, the way that he wanted so i think to the, uh, that is why he acted and so on and you can see that he actually became very popular as an actor as a singer and as a director so as a director he really really excelled and he was the only one who was very cinematic in his approach compared to all the other directors and i think this is the reason why his films stuck in the minds of people if you screen it a hundred times people will sit still sit and watch because his film language was very strong and that appeals to our subconscious mind also as you were mentioning earlier that he did use a more western approach in his filmmaking style but when i was watching most of his films he did use a bit of malay tradition in it is it mm -hmm. more it, is it more into a story perspective to say that it's malay but are using in a western style or was he trying to stick into a malay tradition Okay, you can't es escape the Western aspect because yeah. the cinematic apparatus all mm. came from the West. Mm. But I can see, I can say that uh, Samira Padi mm. was the first true Malay film, which I will go into later. And uh, uh, because he is a Malay himself, and he had some spiritual abilities, mm. uh, he could. Uh, he was a spiritual healer. but he never wanted to use it until you know people asked him and uh, he was very deep into literature uh, into the uh, elements that make the true the true malay so this is what he portrayed in pendeka bujang lapo where he had the three bachelors in search of a master uh, in the foreground story it is to be uh, to learn silat the martial arts from him but actually the hidden aspect of the story is that do not forget your roots leave singapore come to malaya and look for this old man he is the one who can guide you onto the right track 
this is the what is running underneath the firm mm. anyway i'll be talking a bit more about uh, that aspect uh, uh, after this yeah. so um from 1934 to 2019 uh malaysian cinema has always been a malay cinema so it, it seemed like only the malays had problems so they expressed themselves through their film but from to the year 2000 digital technology created filmmakers from all the communities so we began to have malay cinema but malay cinema continued to persist so 40 years later nothing seems to have changed for the malays Uh, from the early films and uh, the problem that they were facing, and Malay filmmakers address this situation through their very through their films in various ways, being critical of their own race, and both Piramli and Uwe, uh, who made Kaki Baka, are in the forefront, which I will be uh, elaborating on. So Semera Padi in 1956 and Kaki Baka 1995, about 40 year uh, gap. and there are some similarities the, about the malay character and psyche and it is to do with interpretation and perception of the malays themselves next so we will talk on uh, samira padi and i see it as uh, addressing the sharia the law the muslim law eh? and also in search of compassion where does the law end and compassion compassion takes over next in the very first shot uh we see smoke and then a solemn voice reads the bismillah in the name of allah the most gracious uh the most uh, merciful uh, uh gr- gracious and the most merciful so uh it is as if this first few shots uh smoke and fire and then the sun and then a mountain and then the camera moves from the sky to the land where people are are planting rice working like the ancient people who inhabited the world so in this few shots <clears throat> piramli i think is saying that god created the world for in the service of man they have to work hard and not not forget uh the archetypal element which is to be good and uh, to be responsible to be disciplined and so on so the first shot is smoke now in the film language smoke is an indicative of something is wrong and then the element of the sun which is a circle the circle is also a negative index like there is something wrong here so the sky is black because they were shooting on black and white and i think they must have used a red filter to make the blue turn into red so that the sun will appear strong and then the shot of the mountain the mountain is always a symbol of higher knowledge but you can see that it is like very murky that something is wrong and then the sky is very contrasty with the landscape and we see an element that is very negative in the opening scene until it comes to the where people are working but one person is playing a flute so in the background we hear this flute sound and i think he put this flute player to show that this music is actually coming from elements of the story itself so god has given bounty so work for it and we see the same element in uwe's film called jogo or the champion at the very beginning we see the sky the camera comes down it shows a paddy field but nobody is working it's been left and the males in the village are all gambling at a uh, bull fighting and then we see uh, the camera moving from the barren paddy field to a graveyard where someone is being buried and that person has been shot because someone was very angry at losing at bull fighting so in a sense uwe is saying 
if the Malays are fighting among themselves, ultimately your land will be gone and, and uh, it will be owned by other people and you are all going to uh, become beggars. Next. So, um, the opening shots uh, depict aspects of the primordial, the creation of the world, the smoke, the forging of the land out of fire, and the word of God and his commandments. So, the sun is now gives light and life. The mountains are pecks, as mentioned in the Quran, with the sky as a ceiling, and the bounty is there. Now, the first shot. Uh, is mentioned, God is mentioned as being merciful and compassionate. But where is this compassion? The last scene in the film, almost the last scene in the film, we see the two people who were transgressors, who went against the laws of Islam and uh, had uh, premarital sex. And ultimately, they were uh, punished. And finally, they were married. And the soundtrack has got uh, the singing of praises to the Prophet Muhammad. So, at the beginning, it is God who laid down the commandments, but it is the Prophet Muhammad who actually intercedes on behalf of human beings so that God will uh, grant compassion to them and save them from hell. So, Samira Padi is a firm that is highly structured it's got a wonderful form. Uh, you see the beginning and the end. And then uh, it has got good gestalt. Gestalt is a German word for form. We normally, when we watch a movie, at the end of the movie, the form comes out to us. Either we like the film or we did not like the film. If we like the film, that means all the parts were arranged correctly. And if it was not, then we would not have liked the film. Okay, next. So here we can see <coughs> the uh, use of something that is recurring, which is the light, the lamp. You can see that the lamp appears in certain scenes, and then in one scene, the light goes out. So this is a motif, M O T I F which we, the director uses to make a subtle comments on the character. So, for example, here is this uh, headman of the village who imposed the Islamic law in this village and is reading the Quran. But the camera actually takes a close-up of the light in the lamp and zooms out and then it shows him. It means there is a gap between him and the light of knowledge. He's, so he has no compassion. He only takes what is in the Quran. And then there is a kris, a dagger on the wall, pointing to him. So he is a, uh, goes by the discipline. He is very strict. Uh, no way that you are going to, you are argue, arguing with him and ask for compassion. And then uh, we see uh, Dara, <coughs> the woman who is going to marry uh, Taruna, sitting on the right, in between them, we see the light. Now, what does this represent? It means there is a connection that uh, Dara loves uh, uh, Aduka, uh, played by Piramli, when she is going to be married to Taruna. So that light connects both of them, because later, even though Taruna finds out that uh, Dara and uh, Aduka uh, are in love with each other and already had sex. He was not angry. So that light shows him to be an enlightened person. Then in the third one above, we see uh, Dara sitting there. The lamp, you can see, is in the foreground, sitting with Taruna. And then later we see in the last slide at the bottom, he comes in, but the light is not there. This is after she and uh, uh, Dara had spent the night together. And that was when the light went out, which means it is a negative indication about what they had done. 
Next. So this is the scene I mentioned. The camera pulls out slowly and then revealing the man, uh, the head man, uh, sitting, reading the Quran, estranged from the real light of knowledge. And when uh, Taruna comes to him uh, to plead for compassion, not to punish his, his friend uh, Aduka, you can see that there is uh, the word Alif Lam Ham Lam Ha Allah at the back. It is, uh, this is called figure and ground relationship in the study of Jastal. It means that he is someone who is actually enlightened unlike the uh, hitman. Okay, next. Now, there are two, there, there is a similarity between Semerapadi and Kakibaka. So, when uh, uh, Aduka, who is in love with Dara, finds out that she's going to be, uh, she's going to marry his friend, he goes off by himself into the jungle and he sits alone and he sings. So that song is the sadness in his heart. He can't do anything about it because this was feudal society and very traditional that whoever has been chosen uh, for Dara to marry, Dara has to accede to it. Now in Kakibaka, uh, when uh, Kakang, uh, played by Ma uh, Khalid, Khalid Saleh, uh, is lamenting his fate about why he is poor and why this uh, rich man doesn't care for him. And then he has to work without being paid because the carpet, uh, he has damaged the carpet. So he's singing and he's actually talking about uh, things that that uh, a normal sane person uh, would know when in fact he is totally opposite to that. Next. And there are other similarities, as you can see here. So, uh, uh, the two characters, uh, this woman and uh, who had this lover to kill her husband, so they are now going to be hunted down by Aduka and Taruna. Now, they are inside the house and the, uh, the woman says, it's better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. They were prepared to die. And this is what we call nihilism. It's a doctrine or belief that conditions in the social organization are so bad as to make destruction desirable for its own sake. That can include suicide. And a viewpoint that traditional values and beliefs are unfounded. That existence is senseless and useless. It's a matter of giving up. And later we find at the end of Kakibaka, that the gun is pointed to his head. But look at his uh, expression on his face. He is prepared to die and he burned uh, the smokehouse. So both, of, both uh, groups are challenging fate. Next. So the woman in love, there are actually two women in love, uh, Dara and uh, that woman who has a lover and got the lover to kill her husband. So here is Dara, who is established at the very beginning. She is mostly standing on the left. This is the strong part of the frame. Whoever is on the left uh, is dominating or is strong. And whoever is on the right is weak or not, not dominant at all. And we see uh, Dara, who was also working in the field, he is in the distance and then he steps over into the plot where Dara is. He, he comes to her, but we do not know whether he is in love with her or not. He tries as much as possible to conceal it. And then after they have finished working, he is walking in the river, washing his feet. And he comes to Dara, who is sitting on the tree trunk across the river. Then we see she looking down upon him again. He, he, we see him a bit lower or not dominating. Then uh, medium, a medium close-up of Dara, the camera is very close. We see the, her eyes 
And this is the scene that is copied from Rashomon. In Rashomon, there is uh, uh, the samurai is sitting on the ground leaning against a tree. The businessman and his wife go past on the horse. He looks at the woman and he is aroused. And how did Kurosawa show his arousal? We see uh, him raising the sword by his side. So that is that represents the, fail, the phallus, and it's a phallic symbol. Now here, Dara is holding a stick. So in a sense, she's saying to uh, wordlessly, I want you. And then she gets up to walk, and we see him still being low. That means she will cause his downfall. So Piramli is questioning. The downfall of Adam was through Eve. So the devil knew he could not, uh, what do you call, manipulate Adam, and so went through uh, Eve and got her to motivate Adam to eat the forbidden fruit. Next. So Piramli had a reference for Samira Padi. So here's uh, Piramli and uh, Dara, sorry, uh, Aduka, who had saved Dara from the bad guys. It is raining. And then they are uh, they stop in the in the jungle at a hut. Now he is standing outside because it was not nice for a man to be in an enclosed space with a woman, according to the religion and to, and, and to traditional society. <coughs> but she has seen her opportunity. She asked him to come in, but he will not. And now she comes to him. So earlier we saw uh, Piramli coming to her. Now she is coming to him. But this time, the situation is different. And it is night. And it is dark. So this is, uh, to a certain extent, the darkness of the mind. And look at the lighting. The lighting is from below, throwing all these dark shadows on the, uh, on the ceiling. And she is now looking at him. He is now on the left. Uh, she is on the right. Uh, so he appears to be the typical warrior. He stands. He is trying to uh, ward off her, her advances. But then he falls to his knees and he says, I'm prepared to sacrifice everything for you, my dear. So just like that woman uh, who was prepared to die, so she herself is prepared to sacrifice everything. And then he uh, succumbs to her advances and the cut is to the light uh, and the light goes out. So that spells uh, disaster for the two of them. Next. So back to that woman in the, and her lover. So we see something very interesting. Why is it that there is a shot, reverse shot. So now the shot is from the two warriors. And then the next shot is from the, the two lovers. It should not actually been done like that if Piramli was trying to say that the two lovers are in the wrong. But I think here he's saying that everyone has the right to protest, to dissent. And when they impose the Islamic law in this village, why did they not ask them uh, whether you know uh, they agree to it or not? So, in a sense, uh, Piramli is on the side of the of the protesters. So here they stand with their daggers and so on, and they are prepared to die. Next, so the introduc uh, introduction. And the close. Uh, uh, God lays down the commandment. This is Islam. This is the law. And you have to follow if you agree to become a Muslim. But it is mentioned that God is gracious and merciful. So what do we do when people have transgressed the law? They get married at the end. Because the Prophet Muhammad uh, said that uh, when a man, reach, when a woman reach a certain age, they must marry so that they continue to procreate. And uh, you have to marry uh, a woman 
who is from a good family and who has a religion. So finally, that uh, the chanting of the praises of the Prophet uh, connects them in a sense saying that they will be saved in the next life. Sorry, then, Pastor. Yeah. Uh, to uh, interrupt, but we have a question there from um, our student from Indonesia. Go okay. ahead, Abraham. Okay, uh, so, sorry to disturb you. I'd like okay. to ask a question, Pak Hassan. Actually, based on <clears throat> what you convey just now, um, P. Ramli have a special healing power, spiritual healing power, right? Yes. Yeah, um, actually, um, I want to know because this movie... Samara Padi is, uh, I think, one of the religious f- film that he made. Actually, it's about hu- hukum hudud that is based on Al Quran. Am I right or not? Yes, but, yes. but it's actually also not just about hukum hudud. It's like questioning hukum hudud. Yes, and then actually, right. I want to know what actually this movie tried to deliver because it's like a. Uh, I'm not sure what this movie actually tried to deliver. Like I just watch, <laughs> but. Yeah, yeah. Based on my understanding, it's like I don't really uh, understand the, what are P. Ramli try to deliver. For example, like any traditional Malay movie about compassion, about uh, togetherness and something like that. I just want to have it like, I want to ask Pak Hassan to be yeah. more clear. Thank yeah. you. Okay. So this film is actually quite complex. Uh, on the surface, it's a film about hudud. Don't go against hudud. Otherwise, you'll be punished, and so on. That is the foreground story. But the background story is more complex. So this is an example of a film that is very unusual. It is only the second film, but Piramli was very much influenced by Kurosawa's two films, and he got this idea. And this was told to me by uh, one of his actors, Uh, working at the same studio, Aziz Jafar. He told me that Piramli took him to see Rashomon and then uh, he exclaimed in surprise at a certain scene and I think it was that scene of the samurai uh, being aroused and so he got the idea to come up with this. But I was also told by the editor of the film magazine that Piramli was very concerned that many of the uh, Malays who had migrated from the villages they had left behind also the religion. So they were living out of wedlock and they were going to cabarets and uh, being very frivolous and so on. So this film was to bring them back onto track. Oh. So I, I think that, that, that is uh, one of the intentions. I see. Because like Kudut is like homosexual and something like that is very taboo, right? Because uh-huh. uh, in my perspective as what you convey, he has special power. I might thought that maybe he have a special relationship uh, towards Allah and then maybe he try to, you know, um, tell the stories based on what his relationship with his religion. Yeah, uh-huh. thank you. Thank you for uh, uh-huh. to make it clear, Pak Hassan. Yeah, you know, Piramli was never been seen as being very religious. Uh, and he was a man who would not show uh, if he was praying, he would try to hide, uh, you know, what he was doing. But he was a very spiritual man. And when I spoke about that uh, uh, mystical element within him, you cannot see this in the film uh, or in any other film. Uh, this was told to me by uh, the singer Ahmad Daud. Uh, was a good friend of mine and he did mention to me how he cured certain people through his uh, uh, spiritual healing powers. Okay, next. Oh, I see. Thank you, sir. Oh, uh, hang on, hang on. Can you go back, go back to the name? Now, there was one element of Kurosawa that he copied. Uh, at the end of the film, as the camera moves out from the two who are sitting on the dais after being married, there is a wipe from right to left. It's just like Kurosawa's famous wife. He likes to do wives. So this is the end of the story of these people, in a sense. That's what he's saying. Then the camera goes out of the house and it is the like God's eye view. And it goes out and a house always represents a family. Okay, And this family is the one that you have to maintain. So 
uh, P. Ramli had a problem with family. He was married three times and all three were divorces. And uh, I think he was, to a certain extent, uh, a lemon of his own uh, uh, life. Okay, next. Sorry, Pak San, there's another question. Uh, it's, yeah. it's becoming very interesting now. Uh, again, a question from uh, May Yuen just now. Go ahead, yeah. May Yuen. <clears throat> Hi, um, Pak Hassan, I, I've got a question. In this movie, right, uh, I think it's still towards the beginning of the movie where a couple was caught um, doing inappropriate activity and they were impaled to death. Yes, yes. But how come towards this end, instead of death penalty, they were only, they received like a uh, hundred uh, canes. Mm -hmm. would, would you think that it's a worse, um, a worse uh, hukuman than the death? Yeah, for two people uh, who, were, uh, who had no attachments to have had uh, sex, it's 100 lashes. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, but for the other two guys, uh, she was married and she got the lover to kill her husband. So, definitely, they deserve a worse fate. So, I do not know the actual Islamic law, whether there was penalty, but I'm sure we also can con conclude they definitely needed to die in a horrible way. But for your information, maybe in the, um, hmm. in the Hudud law, hmm. the punishment uh, for adultery for between non-married couple and for someone who's married is different. The punishment is different. Oh, I see. Uh, because I was wondering, is it because the the girl um is the the penghulu's daughter? So therefore, like there's a I wouldn't say favoritism, but you know, maybe uh, no, no, no. thing has been no, less. No, no, no. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Uh, and uh, I think just now Abraham, uh, he was right. This film is actually questioning Hudud. Yeah. I had the same impression uh, 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 earlier. Mm -hmm. But it was so subtle that until today, nobody had ever criticized Pirami about this. <laughs> Maybe because uh, Malaysians love him so much, Pak Zan. Yeah. And then I was also <laughs> asked by a question by a European after yeah. she saw Pandeka Bujang Lapo. Yeah. She asked me, hey, there's a Kalwat scene. Uh, wasn't there any complaint about it? I said, <laughs> what Kalwat sin? <laughs> I never realized there actually was a Kalwat sin. Yeah. Piramli goes to see uh, Ros Yatima in the room and then he closes the window, closes the door and he sings a love song to her. That is actually Kalwat, isn't it? Uh, but nobody ever realized that. Yeah, but but if, if, you, if you put reference to that, Pak Asad, there are plenty of scenes in his films like that. Uh, one that I remember is, perhaps there are a few actually, in uh, Ibu Metroku. Uh, remember he was also singing, uh, being blind, to Zaitun hmm. uh, when her mom picked him up uh, from, from the gates, you know? Yeah. yeah. Mm. Yes. So there are many instances actually. But I think um, at the time, perhaps, what was there censorship uh, at the time? Pakistan? I don't think so, right? Uh, so yeah, there many was. things got 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 away. I think. Uh, well, uh, there was. He was uh, very clever. For instance, I mentioned that uh, uh, cannot criticize the British, but Piramli did criticize. He had Ahmad Nisfo wearing a British uh, style dress with the cock hat and so on in uh, Pandeka Bujang Lapu. Yeah, that was his very subtle comment. Okay, we can move on, Pazan. Yeah. Next slide. Yes. So, Kaki Baka is uh, based on a short story by William Faulkner called Barn Burning. Uh, it was later made into a feature film called The Long Hot Summer, directed by Martin Ritt. And it was the story of the son of the barn burner. So what uh, Uwe did was he took the basic idea and he had this son uh, following uh, uh, Kakang, the bad burner, around. And then uh, at the end, 
Is he going to end up like the father? He's also going to burn buns? Definitely. Okay. So I see Kakibaka as the distorted education of the son. Okay. Next. And um, uh, Uwe has made quite a number of films. Uh, so far, how many? Two, four, five. Yeah. Five. Yeah, only five, huh? Oh, uh, Black Widow, six. Ah. And uh, he's actually talking about the same thing. And uh, one of the things he's exploring in some films is the sexuality of the Malay man and woman. So the first film was very controversial. And uh, uh, Boy Laju Laju was based on a, short, uh, a novel called The Postman Always Rings, Rings Twice. Uh, which was also made into a film in uh, Hollywood. So we can see how he brought the elements of Malay culture, uh, the Malay milieu into his films, and he has been the most successful and uh, the most authentic uh, in the way he presented, presented it all. Next. <clears throat> now, why, why is it, why do you think that uh, he had the protagonist to be an Indonesian and not a Malaysian. So he's an Indonesian who has married a Malaysian woman. And uh, his name and the name of his son also very, uh, very, very Indonesian. So Piramli has been criticizing the Malays in all his films. It was an exploration of why are they what they are. And Kakibaka is, I think, the most significant of that exploration. So if you were to make Kakang a Malaysian, it would have been too direct. So by making him an Indonesian, uh, it takes off some of the heat that he would get. So he was trying to see what makes the Malaysian man tick. So the, 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 Malay, the Malaysian Malay is a very interesting character. Next. Again, we look at the opening and ending. Can, can we go back? To, okay. The opening is a full moon. And then we see Kakang splashing oil onto a, a smokehouse. And the closing, before he uh, takes the uh, kerosene and goes off, again, we see the moon. It is as if the moon is influencing him. So the word Luna is Latin and lunatic. Uh, people become, some people become lunatic when the moon is full. And uh, people also get this uh, men's uh, uh, health problem called hydrocele when the moon is full because it has an effect on the water in the human body. So here uh, Uwe is saying that when the moon is full, uh, certain things start to happen. Some people become vampires, some become werewolves, and uh, many others become film students. <laughs> oh, that's my silly joke. <laughs> okay, next. So, we see the motives again, just like in Samira Padi, certain motives recur. And here, we see the circle. The circle of the moon, in film language, the circle is negative. And if it is a full moon, that means the film is uh, about horror. But if it is not a horror genre, you still have the moon. That means there's something really, really seriously wrong with the characters in the film. So uh, when he is being, he is on trial, you see what is at the back? Figure and ground relationship. So what is in the background is a comment on the character and it is dark. And you remember his car had a black uh, square painted on the wall, uh, on the doors on both sides. So that is the blackness in his mind. In his mind. Then uh, at the end when he's telling his son to go and get the kerosene, we see the shot through the window inside the house. There is this thing uh, on the wall, uh, on the on the window, uh, 
some kind of a bowl or or pot, which is a circle. Then uh, we see blue light. Now, only in horror movies will we see uh, blue light compared, uh, and also with some blackness uh, appearing all the time. Because that is for a horror movie. And uh, we see the strong contrasty light coming from outside and the lamentation of the wife. The women are always at the wrong end of the stick. Then another element that is negative is uh, stripes. So you see the rich man, the shirt that he wears has got stripes because they are like the bars of a jail. And we see the same thing in Boy Laju Laju, where the woman who plays out the hero and runs off with the property and he lands in jail, she wears a costume uh, with stripes. Later, when she changes that costume, it also has stripes, but of a different kind. And uh, if a hero is headed for danger, uh, he will walk past uh, bars or trees that are all very straight. So that's uh, part of the film language. Next. So this darkness, we see uh, most of the time is shot in the night time and it begins in the night time, it ends in the night time. So uh, there's a visual rhythm here. Uh, there's a similarity at the beginning and at the end and it is as if the light of the moon is falling on uh, the sun who is sitting there wondering uh, what happened. And this is called sliver lighting. So sliver lighting is always to indicate some uh, negative aspect of the character. So uh, nothing has changed. And this keeps on appearing in all his films uh, like... Um, uh, uh, what do you call the story? Uh, Kakibaka, and we see it in Jogo the same thing, nothing changes uh, for the Malays. Next, so the other motifs that are being used this is a wonderful shot of Kakang at the beginning when he is burning somebody's uh, out a uh, uh, smoke house. Uh, look at it, look at his face. It's almost like uh, it looks devilish with the smoke and uh, <coughs> some smoke also comes from his nostrils. That means he's not human. There's some dark thing inside him. So like he has moved over to the dark side. And uh, when they are coming home in the car, we see the son sitting between Kakang and his wife. And uh, we see reflections of uh, the trees falling and breaking up his face. So they could easily have used a polarizing filter to get rid of these uh, reflections. But it was supposed to mean something which is negative and it is connected with the sun. And then uh, two kinds of locations that keep appearing in uh, U.S. films. One is rubber, rubber plantation. The other one is the palm oil plantation. So in Black Widow, his second film, there is a, the house of the heroine is set in the oil palm plantation. And here we see them working in the rubber plantation. Do you need any brains or special skill to work at these two plantations? So that is a reflection of the characters they may be illiterate and probably their rationale also is not there and they are not thinkers. And then a face that is sometimes in shadow, that also says something about the character. In uh, Dan Sykes' film, Bunohan, we see the bad guy uh, who sits uh, facing the camera and there is some kind of a shadow on his face. So he ends up killing his uh, own brothers and his father. And then, of course, fire. Fire consumes. Fire destroys. So this fire is 
uh, reflects uh, Kakang, the man who is a nihilist. And then smoke. If there is smoke, uh, normally we see smoke or mist in a horror movie and blue and black. But here, this film is not a horror movie. So it is uh, connected to uh, the character of Kakang. Next. Then uh, the fate of women uh, in a patriarchal society. So men dominate and women are always the victims. So they have to move every time and then uh, uh, they sit on the floor and then uh, they are always told to do this, to do that. And they are angry, but they cannot express their anger to the father. And then uh, uh, what do you call? Kakang is sitting outside the house. They are reading the Quran, reciting the Quran inside the house. Now, he has the knowledge of uh, being able to recite the Quran and he corrects them, but he is separated from his family. And then they sit in a lot of darkness. So if you uh, remember the paintings of uh, uh, Rembrandt and a few other painters, they always paint with the faces of the people fading into the shadows. So that is to express some kind of uh, alienation. And uh, see how the son is being held by the sisters because uh, uh, Kaka does not want him to follow him. He is fading into the shadows, just like the painting of Rembrandt. Next. And children. The motive of children gets repeated in uh, Isri Perempuan, his first film, and then um, in uh, Kaki Baka. This is the next generation. How will this next generation uh, sub, uh, survive? Will they end up like the adults, uh, like the adults in uh, Isri Perempuan, uh, who don't seem to have any knowledge beyond what they know traditionally. So here we see the son has been very confused and Kakang, instead of motivating the first son who should actually follow him and learn things from him, but he preferred to choose the second son. So that would be already creating a conflict within the family, especially after Kakang dies. Next. So look at the education of the son. Uh, he is being questioned, where's your Javanese? That means, where is your Malay, Malayness? Where is your identity? Who are you really? And then while walking, the way it is shot, this is one point perspective. The road recedes into the distance. This is a negative element. So what he is getting from the father is not the real thing. So. In life, he says, one must have pride. So again, we hear about dignity and sovereignty, which is, seems to be uh, what we call dominant in Mat Kilau. Uh, <coughs> and then it is a comment on the subsidy mentality that the Malays getting a lot of help from the government uh, from from uh, for the last 30 or 40 years, but nothing much seemed to have changed. And then uh, when the son uh, uh, gets into the car, the father tells him to drive. And then later, he tells him to move over. So why doesn't uh, he want the son to drive? So this confuses the son. And then he was trying to defend the father. He said his father didn't burn the, the smokehouse. The father gets very angry and chases him away. So what goes on in the mind of this young boy? Next. So here's the confused son. You can see that he does not wear a shirt in all the shots. And he is crouching like some kind of an animal from looking at the rich man uh, un from under the house. And he's very angry and he's old holding an axe. See, 
is holding an axe or a, or something, and uh, he's reciting the Quran, and then he comes uh, uh, aware that the father is going to burn the another smokehouse, and he wants to prevent him from doing that. But the father gets the children, the the, the sisters. To hold him down, and then he talks back to the father, which he has never done. Last time you sent uh, a Chinese to I I don't know what that refers to, either to get the kerosene or to burn the smokehouse, and he said, "Why don't you send uh, a Indian now?" So it looks like this is the Malaysian family, Chinese, Malay, Indian. So at the end, the son is totally confused. He wants to uh, prevent his father from burning the house, so he runs to the rich man's house and snitches on his father, not expecting what go is going to happen at the end. Next, so who is the enemy here? It is no one but the Malays themselves. So in Samera Padi, is the same thing. And in all the Malay films uh, made in Singapore, and even now, the enemy is within. But the politicians are always uh, are blaming the the other Chinese, Indians, and whatever. And we see this in Mat Kilau. After more than 50, 60 years, what is going on? So here we see. Uh, the Malay capitalist, uh, he gets Kakang to work on his uh, rubber plantation, but doesn't discuss payment. We'll discuss this when I get back. And of course, Kakang is not going to get very much. And then, <coughs> look at the uh, decor decorative exterior of the house of the rich man, as compared to Kakang's house. Such a wide gulf between them. And then he comes and points a gun at his head. So again, we see sliver lighting. Very strong contrast that makes them look evil. And the gun is always associated with evil people. And earlier, there was a di dialogue where uh, he tells uh, the assistant that he has already shot four monkeys. So he's a killer. And at the end, he's holding the gun to the head. But this time, uh, and, and he tells Kakang, now it's all over for you. So he doesn't care whether he's shooting monkeys or he's shooting a man. So if Kakang is uh, not a good guy, what about this Malay uh, rich man who is, uh, of course, has had education? So no difference. Next. So we see the enemy is within in Pendeka Bujang Lapo in 1929, two years after independence, the arrogant Malay capitalist. He has succeeded, but instead of helping struggling Malays to come up, he, his, he and his ferry workers treat the customers very, very roughly. And then he comes and he's holding a cane. So a cane, he can beat people with a cane. So that cane already signifies his character and wearing the British hat. And look at the way the, the ferry workers uh, surround him. Next. So Jalan Pintas, directed by Namron in 2011, he's saying the same thing. The arrogant, both successful and unsuccessful Malays are not helping struggling uh, Malays to succeed. So we see this boy leaving his home and you see the barren paddy land, it cannot be worked anymore. And so he has to got to go to the city. He has studied to be an engineer. He was only five minutes late and he was five minutes late because of these hooligans who almost uh, beat him up. And he was only five minutes late, but see how the receptionist and the boss say uh, that punctuality is utmost important. Uh, they don't want to listen to his excuses. They don't care 
for him. And we see the hooligans who uh, uh, accost him and then finally there is a killing. Next. And uh, in Mat Kilau, eh, sorry, Hantu Kalima by Mamad Khalid, he is also basically saying the same thing, that the any, real enemy is within. So the first shot is of Malays, and I uh, conjecture that this is how when the Malays first migrated to the peninsula, they came by boat and they built their house by the riverside and they were so happy, they were adventurous and uh, coming to a new land. But look at the last shot. They are working at a kiln where they make coal from wood. Now, among uh, the traditional society, this is the lowest form of work that you do. So what has happened? Why have they not succeeded? So there's a line of dialogue that uh, from one of the characters. You know why the Malays find it hard to progress? Even when they are shoveling coal, they are still concerned with the past. So the past here is the feudal mentality that is still persistent among the Malays today and being uh, employed by the politicians. Next. So in Mat Kilau, which is just uh, concluded, there are concerns of Malay dignity and sovereignty. So if you look at the dialogue in the film, uh, they are demanding and saying very, very loudly, this is the land of our ancestors. That means they belong to them. Islam is my religion. My race is Malay. They, they don't care about others. Do not forget the special rights of the Malays. When it is already enshrined in the constitution, why do you need to say it? Where is Malay sovereignty in the eyes of the British? Wait for the rise of the Malays. Why do they need to rise when they are in control of everything in Malaysia? Next. And then other dialogue. And this time, they are complaining that the enemy is the other. So the foreigners always look for opportunities. They are blaming the foreigners. As immigrants, be aware of your place. That means have proper manners and uh, uh, be careful of the sensitivities of the Malays and Muslims. Next. Ah, this one is a contradiction. Now, this is bad script writing and bad dialogue writing. If the aim of Mat Kilau was to promote Malay nationalism and Malay dignity and Malay sovereignty of Ketuanan Melayu, this should not be there. So, uh, it's a contradiction. It said Malays are like beggars in their own country. The land of the Malays is in danger. The Malays are easily bought. Promise me, Father, that you won't become a traitor. So, this is a reference to the recent political events over the last two, three years, where many of the politician, Malay politicians have been traitors and they have jumped ship from one party to another. So it will be interesting to see what happens in the next elections. So this film, in a sense, is aimed is a kind of propaganda and also a kind of promotion uh, to motivate the Malays to vote for we all know who. Next. So, Malay cinema, uh, Malaysian cinema is very interesting because of all of this. It may be silly, but it is always interesting. That's the close. Okay. So, that character there is from which film, Pasan? Uh, the one on the right? Yeah. <laughs> the film that I'm going to make. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Okay, so that's the end of the slides? Yes. Okay. So, question time? Yes. So, we have... Um, we ha we, now it's 10.20, actually. Um, uh, probably we, we stop at 10.30. Uh, yeah. If you're okay with that, Pasan? Yeah. 
Yeah, sure. uh, because um, I think this session is a bit interesting because there seems to be a lot of um, uh, curiosity um, from the students um, and a bit of a discussion. Um, any any more questions from anybody? Or have they gone to sleep? <laughs> I'm I'm good, sir. Pak uh, Hasan. Um, discuss it very clearly, very detailed. Thank you. I must say that the uh, films of Indonesia are very well done in terms of uh, promoting unity and uh, nationalism among Indonesians, all Indonesians. So uh, Hanung Bramantio is a friend of mine and I love his films. And is uh, Ainun and Habibi. You can see his film language is so strong. Oh. And he makes his criticism to be very subtle. He doesn't. Uh, if there are bad guys in Indonesian, Indonesian society, but they are not being, uh, you know, blatantly put out there. So, like uh, Joko Anwar, uh, Joko Anwar is another friend of mine. Uh, <clears throat> he did Gundala. Gundala was supposed to be a superhero film, but surprisingly, the superhero is a whim. So, uh, what does he do? So. Almost like other directors, like uh, especially Garib Nubroho, eh? uh, uh, for him and for Joko, every Indonesian is a hero. And in the film, they show, even though they have a main character, but everybody is coming into play and they all have their roles to play uh, in, Malaysian, uh, in Indonesian society. I think until today, Indonesian movie is still growing. I have watched I know Habibi actually, Bahasan, yeah. the, the movie. Actually, Indonesian movie now growing very drastically. Yeah. A lot of new movie coming out. Actually, I want to ask you one more question, Bahasan. What is the difference between uh, pengulas and pengkritik? I don't get it. Like, <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so, when a film comes out and the newspapers write about it, uh, that is a pengulas, a reviewer. He just reviews the film, but unfortunately, they become film critics. Uh, they lose their way. So you shouldn't do that. You should be supporting your film industry. Uh, if the film is really bad, uh, just don't write about it. Okay? Or write after the film has finished screening in the, in the cinemas. But a film critic needs to see the film twice. The first time, to just see the story, uh, uh, what do you call it? see the visuals and uh, appreciate the story. But the second time, if you're going to write critically, then you have to look at the details. Okay? If you didn't like the film, you must say why. But don't say uh, the ending should have been like this. Cannot. If you want the ending to be like that, you go and make that, that ending. That is not your concern. You just talk about the text. What is in the film? What did what worked and what did not work? And you know, uh, so many very well made films all over the world, including Hollywood, have been criticized. Uh, but the thing is, uh, Kurosawa has commented on this in his film Rashomon. Did you realize that Rashomon is actually about cinema? And the four people who are looking at the camera, they are looking at the audience. And they experienced the same incident, but they had four different versions, including the ghost uh, of the uh, guy who got killed. And what is the clue that it is about cinema? At the end of the film, after they have come out, uh, the rain has stopped, there is a long shot, and we see the gate. And then there is a motif at the back. It is white, like a cinema screen, and it is repeated two or three times. And uh, Kurosawa said, uh, Rashomon was not about the nature of truth. It was about the ego of man, that each one has his own interpretation. And so, if 10 people see a film, they have 10 different versions. And it, and it is based on their ideology, their beliefs, their likes and dislikes. And there was an experiment made in the US that uh, I think 10 people came to see a film. 
when uh, when they were asked, they had ten totally different versions. And then upon investigation, they found out that one person had too much uh, uh, had had his lunch, and he was full up. And then uh, there were scenes that uh, of people eating, and he was not interested in watching it, and he had a different uh, opinion. And another person did not have time to have lunch, and he was very hungry when he saw the food on the cinema, and he said, "This is a very bad film." And think, think like that. So you see, uh, 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 I don't know if you have seen uh, the film The Wailing. The Wailing is actually the Korean version of Rashomon. So there's a Japanese at the beginning of the film, and he's fishing, and he's wearing a hat al almost similar to the hat that Kurosawa wears. And in the book by Donald Ritchie uh, of uh, the the films of Kurosawa. Uh, there is a dialogue between uh, Kurosawa and one of his actors. They were shooting Seven Samurai and money ran out halfway. So Kurosawa decided to go fishing. And the actor asked him, so now what are we going to do? Well, he said, the producer has spent a lot of money. He will have to find the, uh, the balance of the money. So I think it was based on that, that they had uh, their director of uh, the whaling had Kurosawa fishing by the river. And in the film, there are two people. And we see the use of the still camera, which represents them, uh, which uh, uh, signifies them as to be actually representing filmmakers. So the Japanese is very weird. He does something that cannot be understood. And he's also taking photographs. Then you have the Korean uh, witch doctor or medicine man. He is very smartly dressed. And then he is investigating. He also takes photographs. And then when he does his ritual, as compared to the Japanese, uh, very mystical, very uh, strange, his ritual is very flamboyant, uh, which is uh, like uh, he is making modern cinema, which entertains. There's drum beating, people dancing, waving flag, and so on. And um, uh, what do you call uh, there's another element, uh, ah, yeah. the poster of Rashomon and Wailing is almost exactly the same. And two people sit outside the gate talking in the Wailing, similar to the two people talking uh, at the gate in uh, uh, Rashomon. Then the medicine man comes to the gate, but he cannot go beyond the gate because that's the area of the indie filmmaker represented by the Japanese, who is actually Kurosawa. So that's how you read. And in Mizon Sen, the way the director arranges things, there are certain things being repeated or added uh, in the setting. It, those are all clues for you to interpret. Okay, thank you, sir. Understand. Yeah, there's a very uh, long answer for you, Abraham. Um, <laughs> you understood. <laughs> yeah, yeah, understand, understand. I yeah. take some of the uh, highlight some of the point. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, any more questions from anybody? It is now ten twenty nine. Oh, uh, yes, Dashini. Perhaps this is the last question. Go ahead, Dashini. Hello, Dashini. Hello. Yes, go ahead. Um, is this just a general question? But is there actually similarity and differences between Malaysian and Indonesian cinema industry in terms of the movies that was mentioned earlier? Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. Yes, there is a big difference. Uh, mm -hmm. similarities are seen in only a few filmmakers in the sense that the filmmaker is a thinker. And that means his story is deeper and there are things that are being said very, very subtly because a filmmaker should not criticize openly. Like Makilao is a bad example of a, of a film where everything is direct. But uh, I cannot blame Shamsul. Uh, I understand why he has done it. 
uh, he knows that the Malaysian audience just want to go for entertainment. They want to enjoy. And that's why I call it a fun fair movie where there's a lot of shouting, yelling, uh, fast moving, camera shaking and so on. But uh, on the negative side, he uh, considers uh, Malaysian uh, audience to be of low intellect. They want only this kind of film. So uh, in the 70s, there were also many bad Indonesian films. I've seen most of them because I was beginning to get interested in film. And the first film that I saw was uh, uh, Machan Kemayoran. And uh, I saw it seven times. Why? Because of the mystical element and the uh, silat. And I was learning silat at that time. And uh, it was based on a novel. So that's why it was so strong. And it was uh, about the enemy within. So they had the Dutch, but actually there were other Japanese, uh, Javanese, uh, who were actually the enemies. And uh, that was, the, that it always causes the problem for anyone in the, uh, any, any country. And then Tugo Karya, who I knew personally, I loved all his films. And he is a uh, Chinese Catholic making films about Malays and Muslims. So that's very unusual. And I asked him, what is cinema to you? He said, I put you on the screen. If you can see yourself among the characters, I have succeeded. It's not very different from what Andre Bazar, the film philosopher, said in the 1940s. Uh, he said that the cinema screen is like a window where we spy upon the lives of others that reflect our own lives. So basically talking about the same thing. So if uh, you look at uh, Indonesian and Malaysian cinema, uh, here we have uh, Chinese making films about Chinese, which earlier under the new order of Suharto, this didn't happen. Uh, there was one film called Cha Guk something. Uh, it was about Chinese uh, living without marrying with a with a Indonesian woman, so that was very unusual. This was, I think, immediately after Suharto was made. So there, uh, the language is definitely Bahasa Indonesia, but here there is a total mix, as you can see in Yasmin Ahmad's films. But in terms of uh, deep philosophical thought, I can say that. Indonesian cinema has got it. For instance, a very mainstream film like uh, Keluarga Cemara, uh, I really enjoyed that film. There was no uh, conflict uh, in the normal sense of the word. It was just about a family and about how the family overcame its own problems. And there was no yelling, there was no quarreling. That kind of film is very difficult to do. Uh, that means the writer must be a thinker. And even I know Nan Habibi, yeah? Uh, it's also quite similar. And I could see the character of the Indonesian people reflected in Habibi. And ultimately, he served only one term as a minister because he should not have been a politician. And I remember the scene where uh, he was in Germany, but he was being asked to come back. And there's a scene where he is walking up a slope and he was seen in an extreme long shot. The film language is telling me that the extreme long shot shows something negative. And going up is difficult, isn't it? Yes. And the dialogue is saying that he's been called. So in a sense, the director is saying that Habibi should not go and become a minister. Very clever. Mm -hmm. So this aspect of film language is not in the majority of Malaysian cinema. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think I will have to end it here. Uh, Pak Hasan, we have gone way beyond 10 o'clock as planned. But thank you very much again, Pak Hasan, for being with us again. Um, the, the last time Pak Hasan was invited to give an analysis of the film Mat Kilau, uh, that was not under Asian cinema. Um, but this time is his first time with the Asian cinema class for master students. But Pak Hasan will so thank you very much again, Pak Hasan. Yeah, pleasure. And, and and for going overboard with the time. Um, a lot of a lot of points there that needs to be 
that you really need to think about. So I hope the students did not get lost. Um, but anyway, Pak Hassan will be coming back um, next week for your class again here um, to talk about Malaysian cinema part two uh, and hopefully to go deeper into when cinema becomes Malaysian. Right, Pak Hassan? Yeah. Yeah. Um, any final words, Pak Hassan? Before we end this, <laughs> so uh, uh, I don't expect you to grasp everything, but it's important to hear. Uh, and if you have heard it later when you read books and so on, uh, you will remember uh, what I've said. And then when you are watching movies, uh, you will remember some aspects of the film language that I've mentioned. And then you will connect it to Samara Padi, Kakibaka, and then you will become your own teacher. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Pasan. And um, I will see you again tomorrow morning. Yeah, sure. Uh, we have we have a rest. Then when we wake up, we meet again mm -hmm. uh, for a session, not for the master students, but for the undergraduates in audience studies. And Pasan will be talking about mise en scène. Right. Thank you, Pasan. Okay, pleasure. You are a legend. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you and good night, everybody, wherever you are. We'll see you again. Bye-bye.